last Monday, we started on chapter eight, uh, general concepts of bonding. And we're going to finish that today with sharing this set of PowerPoints. And let's see, slide show. And from current slide. There we go. Okay. Um, up to this point, we've, we've talked about um, what is a chemical bond, um, concepts of electronegativity that um, uh, determine whether the bond itself is ionic or covalent or nonpolar or polar covalent and then sort of hinted at the possibility that a molecule that has polar bonds may not be polar overall based upon its geometry. We're going to dig into the geometry today. Okay, so let's get started with that. Okay, <clears throat> here was a, a very useful theory that appeared in the first part of the 20th century called the valence bond theory. And basically all it said was that, um, first of all, you only need to be considering, you only need to consider valence electrons and their orbitals when you're uh, proposing a bond. Uh, the other electrons, the core electrons are not involved in bonding. And secondly, that those uh, orbitals and the electrons that they contain form a bond by overlapping. So now we're talking about sharing, right? We're not talking about ionic bonding. We're talking about covalent. So when those orbitals overlap, you get the sharing of electrons and uh, the stabilizing influence that that has on the combination. Otherwise, the bond wouldn't form. Okay, so within this valence bond theory uh, is the first model that we're gonna introduce is called the localized electron model. Uh, and it derives from the valence bond theory. Uh, what it says is that the electrons involved in bonding still in some respect belong to the original atom that contributed them. That's what we mean by localized. The electrons are localized, that is, they belong to the atom that donated them uh, and they're only um, shared with the other atom. Uh, this and this itself is a uh, beginning steps in the developing theory of um, uh, the of the quantum mechanics. So we'll we'll talk about quantum mechanics a little more as we go along. Uh, we're not going to dig into the mathematics too much of quantum mechanics. It's just way way beyond this course and frankly, way beyond your instructor. <clears throat> but it was proposed by um, uh, these two fellows, Heitler and London. And I'm curious, I wonder if that's London from London Dispersion Forces, probably is. And then Linus Pauli was involved in the, this uh, localized electron model. Okay, so now, what good is it? Uh, we need to look at, I mean, a model is, is only as good as its ability to predict results. So, <clears throat> these um, electron pairs that we alluded to in last, the part one, uh, form bonds. And we can divide electrons into uh, one of two categories. They, these electrons are either involved in bonding, 
in which case they're called bonding pairs. Uh, and two electrons, a pair of electrons makes one bond. Or they can be lone pairs. Is they can still be uh, localized to the atom from which they're derived. Uh, for instance, if we draw a model of, um, uh, well, let's take water. Right. right, each one of these hydrogens has one electron. Oxygen has six valence electrons, and you can derive that from where it's located in the periodic table, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six valence electrons. And these two are involved, they overlap, and these two overlap to form single bonds. What's left over? Well, you've still got these two, two pair, lone pair of electrons. They still belong to oxygen, excuse me. These electrons belong to the bond. Um, okay, that's enough said about that. Uh, this is the starting point for the localized electron model. Now we're going to talk about uh, part one and part two of this scenario here. <clears throat> and we're, we're going to reserve part three, a discussion of um, uh, orbital hybridization, which is still part of the localized electron model, but it takes a little more effort and time than we have uh, right now. So we're going to hold it until chapter uh, nine. Okay. Uh, but we're going to talk about the um, elect the arrangement of electrons around an atom, and we're going to use uh, uh, a method proposed by G. N. Lewis and draw the Lewis structure for each atom as we uh, start to bond them together. And then we're going to use another model, the VSEPR model, and I'm, I'll explain that in a minute, to predict the geometry. But these come in steps. We've got to do this one first, then we can do that one, and uh, derive lots of information, useful information, from this particular model, the localized electron model. Okay. So, um, uh, Lewis proposed his method of arranging valence electrons around an atom uh, in 1918. And uh, I've just used that method right here. Okay, we're going to learn how to do that in just a minute so that you can do the same thing and propose bonding for uh, various combinations of atoms. And it's all based upon that concept we introduced last, uh, during part one, that um, atoms bond by tending toward a noble gas electron configuration. And for our purposes, we're going to focus on the octet. They want to have an octet, which would be the noble gas configuration, and they bond in order to derive that. <clears throat> so uh, Lewis proposed writing the atoms with their valence electrons positioned around the symbol. And then that way you can visualize the interaction of atoms and what types of combinations would tend toward noble gas configuration for each one the octet, okay, um, except, for, <laughs> except for hydrogen, of course. Uh, hydrogen doesn't have room for an octet. It only needs one extra electron, which is the duet. So hydrogen tends toward the duet, which would be helium structure. The rest of them are octets. Okay, 
uh, fluorine, these diatomics are uh, good examples to go from. Two fluorines come together because if they share one electron each, then they can each acquire an, the uh, appearance of an octet. Single bonds are, are one line. Right? Double bonds are two lines, like we mentioned last time. Triple bonds are three lines. Now here's how you write a Lewis dot structure. Now these are the steps. Um, and rather than just read it to you, we'll, um, uh, let's see. Maybe I better skim through it anyway. So first we're going to sum the valence electrons from all the atoms that we want to put into a molecule. So you need to know what is a valence electron and count them for each atom. Then you form single bonds among the atoms with the most electronegative in the center. And that's a general rule. Sometimes it doesn't work that way, but most of the time it does. Um, and then, uh, here's a good point. Sometimes more than one structure can be proposed. More than one Lewis dot structure for a molecule can be proposed. And as long as they satisfy the Lewis rules that we're going to discuss, then they're valid until I show you how to break the tie. Right, we'll get to that in a, in a minute or two. Um, most of the time, uh, atoms that are in a structure will have an octet, or for hydrogen, a duet. But there are exceptions. Right? And why would we need exceptions? Well, for the simple fact that nature rules. If we know that a molecule forms of a certain number of atoms, like this one, for instance, or on trihydride, that one for boron, for the hydrogens, the duet rule holds. Or for boron, the uh, octet rule does not hold. But that is a compound. It's isolated, purified, characterized. It's real. But it doesn't obey the octet rule. So we have to make exceptions. That's one where you don't make a full octet for boron. There are others where you make more than an octet. And we'll also discuss those as we go along. Uh, just recognize that the octet rule, it's a way that we, uh, the Lewis dot structures, and this whole theory, as a matter of fact, uh, is a way for us to wrap our minds around reality. And when reality disagrees, who wins? <laughs> reality, of course. Okay, so here's an example for water. I'll just go through these slides and then we'll, we'll do some others. For water, add up the valence electrons. Right, so how many are for hydrogen? Well, hydrogen's only got one electron, so there are two of those. Right? Oxygen has six valence electrons. I, well, I just showed you that one. So six plus two is eight. So we have eight electrons that have to be positioned somewhere in that molecule. So the next step is you form single bonds with oxygen in the center. It's the more electronegative atom, so it goes in the middle. And besides, you can only form one bond with hydrogen anyway, so it wouldn't make sense to put hydrogen in the middle. It would, just wouldn't work. <clears throat> anyway, you've got those two. Now, how many electrons did we use out of the eight? Two, four. That means we have four electrons left. Okay, so what do you do with those four electrons? You start from the outside, and you add them until you reach the noble gas configuration for each of the atoms as you move inward. So hydrogen, it's already got its duet, right? So the four extra electrons have to go on the oxygen. Right? So we put them there, two, four. 
So, and then you check. Hydrogen has a duet, right? It has two electrons there, two electrons there for that hydrogen. Oxygen has how many? Two, and then four, and then six, and then eight. So oxygen has its octet, right? So that's a valid Lewis dot structure. Um, we haven't gotten to a discussion of geometry yet, right? Notice that it's not written the way I, I usually write it on the board. But that's the Lewis dot structure for water. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, before we show those, let's do these other two. Uh, phosphorus tribromide. That is a real compound. Okay. How many valence electrons do we have? Well, you find phosphorus on the chart. It's uh, right here under nitrogen, which means it has five valence electrons. It's in the, the number five Roman numeral group. So we have five here. How many does bromine have? All halogens have seven valence electrons. So that's seven times three. So 21 plus five is 26. So we have 26 electrons that have to be positioned. Phosphorus uh, goes in the middle. Right. It's above. It may be to the left, but it's still above bromine. It's uh, more than likely more electronegative. That's just the way it is. Sometimes you just have to know. Phosphorus goes in the middle. Okay. We need one bromine here, one bromine there, one bromine there. Two, four, six. So we, now we have 20 electrons left over that have to be positioned. So you start a wagon wheel. You say one, two, three, four. Actually, that's not right. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, we use nine. Notice I'm not pairing them up yet. I'm trying to follow Hun's rule. You don't pair them up until you filled. Uh, we just put them all around. So that was uh, three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Right? Two, four, six, eight. Each one of the bromines has an octet now. And that was 246 times 3 is 18. So we have two electrons left. Now, we've worked our way into the middle. Phosphorus has that pair. We've used up all of our electrons. That's a valid Lewis dot structure. And for the, in this case, the octet rule holds for each one. There's 2, 4, 6, 8. Eight, eight, eight. So that would be our Lewis dot structure for phosphorus tribromide. Okay. Now let's do HCN. What is HCN? Remember how to name your acids? Well, if it's not an aqueous solution, it's hydrogen cyanide, correct? Which is a lethal gas. Dissolved in water, it's hydrocyanic acid. But it doesn't matter. Not for our purposes. We're going to draw the structure, the Lewis dot structure. Okay. So add up your electrons, your valence electrons. One from here, carbon, four valence electrons, nitrogen, five, same as phosphorus. Right, so that's 10. Um, just a word, you can write Lewis dot structures for ions too, like polyatomic ions, like ammonium, NH4 plus. When you do that, what do you do with the sign? Well, you add up all your electrons for neutral, atom, for neutral atoms, yes, 
Then you take the sign. If it's a negative, one negative, add an electron. If it's two negatives, add two electrons. See? If it's a positive, like ammonium, you subtract an electron. Then you start building your model. But in this case, it's neutral, and we have 10 electrons. So I infer from the way this is written that carbon is in the center. Nitrogen's here, hydrogen's there. Now, it could be written the other way, in which case the nitrogen will probably be written over here and the carbon over there. That example that we looked at um, last week when we were doing um, pizza formation, we're adding up bond energies. The one thing that changed was they switched carbon and nitrogen. Okay, in this case, carbon's in the middle, so that's two, four. We got a position, six electrons. Hydrogen's full already, so we go to nitrogen. Six electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, all of our electrons are in the model, but we need to find a way, if at all possible, for making an octet. Right, nitrogen's got an octet, hydrogen's got a duet. Carbon's only got four electrons, two, four. How can we give carbon four electrons without damaging the octet for nitrogen? Well, if we take these two and make a bond, and take those two and make another bond, that gives carbon an octet, but it's still in the bonding, gives nitrogen its octet. So now we would write it this way. Okay, and that gives you two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, and two. And we did that with only the electrons that were allowed, the valence electron. So that would be a valid Lewis dot structure for hydrogen cyanide. Okay, those are two very simple ones. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Come on. All right. Um, I'm not sure why I put this one in here because we haven't talked about structure yet about geometry, yes, structure, sorry, geometry. We haven't talked about geometry yet. So we're gonna explain in just a few minutes why this is the valid uh, geometry for water and not this. Okay, uh, all right, we're gonna have to do these on our own. Um, let's skip these, they're too easy. Let's get something a little more complicated. How about ammonia? Let's see. Let me keep up with my hard copy here. Yeah. Okay, so ammonia is like this. Three electrons there, five there. So three plus five is eight. Okay. So we have nitrogen in the middle. two, four, six. So we have two electrons that have to go, can't go here, so they have to go here. That would be our ammonia, Lewis dot structure. Carbon dioxide, four for the carbon, and oxygen has six. So two times six is 12, plus four is 16. Okay, carbon goes in the middle. Here we go, two, four, 12 electrons. So if we put two, four, six, two, four, six, we've used up all of our electrons, right? So now we've got to make a octet for carbon. Well, 
we could take both of the electrons from from one side and just leave them alone on the other side. That would be a valid Lewis dot structure, but it wouldn't be the ideal. And we haven't talked about a uh, formal charge yet, so I can't explain that just yet. I will later. But the preferred is to take one pair from this side, one pair from that side. So now we have That's a carbon dioxide dot structure. Okay, one more, carbon tetrachloride. Okay, carbon tetrachloride. So we have how many for carbon? Four. And chlorine, we have seven times four which is 28 plus four is what? 32? 32 electrons. So we have carbon in the middle. One, two, three, four chlorines. Two, four, six, eight. So we have 24 electrons that we need to position. We can wagon wheel it just like we did before. But we're going to find out that 24 electrons, each one of these needs six more, which means six into 24 is four. Each one gets six. There we go. And they're all used up. Everybody's got an octet, including carbon. Okay. Now here's the example I mentioned earlier, boron trihydride. Let's see, am I still on the camera? Let's move that back a little bit. There we go. All right. <clears throat> um, boron is in the group with aluminum. It has three valence electrons and then three from hydrogen. So that'd be six. If you draw the structure with boron in the middle, so two, four, six, they're all used up. There are no other electrons that you can place, place on boron. So boron is octet deficient. So it's electronic structure in this case, would be more akin to, let's say, uh, two, four, six, three. Be more like oxygen. Here's an example, uh, two examples actually, of exceeding the octet. So if we say sulfur has how many? Six. It's in oxygen's family. Calcogens. Uh, fluorine has seven each, so that's 28 plus six is 34. So we put two, four, six, eight here around sulfur. Sulfur is happy right now. Fluorine, so that's uh, it's eight from 34 is um, 26. And if we put six around each fluorine, fluorine, that's 24. So we've got two left over. Where do you go? You've got to put them on the central atom. So that's, so two, four, six, eight, ten. Sulfur has 10 valence electrons, uh, one lone pair and four bonding pairs. Now, how can we get away with that for sulfur? Notice where sulfur is in the periodic table, right here. What period is that? Period three, right? Sulfur has access to a 3s orbital, a 3p orbital and a 3d orbital. So there is a place for those lone pair electrons. They slide into a d orbital with this model. Okay. Now a similar situation arises for arsenic pentabromide with 40 electrons. Once you position them 
two, four, six, eight, ten to get your first bonds in for bromine. And then it leaves 30. So you have uh, five times six is, is 30, right? So you've got all of these bromines with their octets. Arsenic has 10 electrons. Well, arsenic is in period four. So it also has access to 4D orbitals. So that's not a problem for arsenic. It's got available orbitals for these bonds to form, just as sulfur had an extra uh, d orbital for that lone pair. Okay. Uh, let's see how we doing on time and okay. Let's do boron trifluoride. Here we go. We've got uh, three times seven is 21, plus boron is three, 24. 24 electrons. So we have boron in the middle, fluorines around, right? Two, four, six. 18 electrons. So if we put six around each one of these, that'll give them octets. Three times six is 18, correct? And they're all gone, just like that. Now, um, what else could we do? Well, in this case, uh, remember boron trihydride, we were not able to form a double bond with hydrogen because that would uh, exceed its duet by quite a bit. But in this case, we could conceivably do that. And in that case, we would have a double bond there. Now boron can have its octet. But what's to say that 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 was the fluorine that donated the, the uh, pair. What about this one? It could have donated a pair. That one could have donated a pair. Each one of those is valid. Right. So you have three valid Lewis dot structures. Um, we're not gonna, well, maybe we are. Hold on a second. Yes, we are. So what if we had one over here with uh, boron, and fluorine, fluorine there, and fluorine there. We have one over here with boron and a fluorine and a fluorine there, and fluorine there, with all their dots. Okay, they're valid. So how do you get around that? Well, this is one of those cases where the theory starts to break down, right? Because the electrons are localized, we can't, they have to be either in the bond or assigned to an atom, right? So each one is valid, but we know from experimental data, what did we say about bonds? As you add a bond, the bond gets shorter, right? This double bond should be shorter than these other two, right? Or that one should be shorter than those two. There should be a difference in fluorine bond, uh, boron fluorine bond length for at least one of the fluorines in each of these scenarios. The fact of the matter is when you measure those bond lengths, they're all the same. They're somewhere in between single and double bond length. Single bond length would be like this, Double bond would be like that. Those bond lengths are in here somewhere. Okay. So we know reality is that all of these bonds are equivalent. So that's where the theory breaks down, right? So how do we get around it? Well, um, 
you could start over, but that's not what was decided. They said, okay, we're going to tweak the theory a little bit. We're going to introduce a concept called resonance. The molecule resonates among all three of those structures. And that's how we get around it. Okay, there's one of them, but the other two are valid. There's a, a phosphorus pentachloride. Notice it had exceeds the octet for phosphorus. That's okay. Phosphorus has a 3D orbital available. Sulfur, one, two, three, four, five, six. It has 12 electrons. That's fine. Sulfur has access to D, access to D orbitals also. Why is it okay? Because that molecule is real and it has to be okay. <laughs> it can't be anything else if you want to maintain the theory, if you want to hold on to the theory. Okay. Uh, so when we're, when we're bonding atoms together, we can assume that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine will always obey the octet rule. We haven't found any examples where they don't. So that's fairly safe. And it's good because they're in the second period. They don't have access to D orbitals. So those will follow the octet rule. Boron and beryllium, they, their molecules uh, the compounds that they form often have less than eight electrons. Second row elements um, cannot exceed the octet rule. They might be deficient, but they cannot exceed it. And that's sort of a corollary to the first one, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Third row and heavier elements, they can exceed the octet because they have access to D orbitals. Um, this usually, uh, this statement here says that first you, you build the best Lewis dot structure you can. And if you have any leftover electrons, put them on the atom that has available D orbitals. And that usually, at least for our purposes, that will be the central atom. Okay, here's another example of resonance. Um, actually, it was proposed by Linus Pauling to uh, tweak the theory so that we could, could keep the localized electron model without having to just toss it out. Um, notice also that this is an ion the nitrate ion in O3 minus. So that means, let's add up our electrons. Five for nitrogen and three times six for oxygen, which is 18. 18 and five is 23. Then you add one for the charge, 24 electrons. Then you build your model. And notice that uh, if you write this without the brackets and the charge, then it's wrong. It has to have the charge. Otherwise, we cannot justify the extra electron that we have positioned in that model. It must have the charge. Um, but you could write double bonds here for any one of these three oxygens and create those valid Lewis structures. So we have to resonate with this model. That's the only way, well, Maybe not the only way, that's the best way, the accepted way for tweaking the model to fit with the uh, physical evidence. Um, what we're saying is actually that these electrons are delocalized, 
which is kind of a stretch for the localized electron model, is it not? If you can delocalize electrons. That's a second. You know, hold on just a second. I think I got it. Yeah. Okay. No problem. I've got a cat under my desk. I was wondering why the door was pushed open. <clears throat> okay. So this concept of delocalizing is stretching the boundaries for the localized electron model. But it's necessary in order to get resonance to happen. Otherwise, how do you go from this one to that one? Those electrons have to move. Right? They've got to move over here. Or they have to, maybe these electrons must move back here and be replaced by electron from there. That's more likely what happens. And that, of course, happens so fast that when you measure the bond length, they're all the same. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's try. Uh, we did carbon dioxide already, right? so we don't have to do that one. Carbon monoxide. Let's see what happens when you only have one oxygen. Okay, let's get this back in position. There we go. Carbon monoxide. Right. So we got four for this one, and we got six for that one, so that's 10 electrons. Okay, carbon, oxygen. So where do you start? There's not a central atom here. Well, you wagon wheel the whole thing. 10 electrons. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Actually, you know what, we sh what I should have done? To obey the rules, the more electronegative atom gets the lion's share. So I should do that and put it over here. That would be proper. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So localized, localized speaking, uh, oxygen should have its octet first. Right, so we've positioned all of our electrons. Now what we need is uh, this one already has an octet. Carbon needs two more. So it needs another bond to give it one more, another bond to give it another one. So if we do this, and this, like that. How would that do? Well, what that does is, is leave us with unpaired electrons out there. So let's see what it looks like though. That's what it would look like. So that won't work, right? Because it gives us too many. So what do we need to do? Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. We got those extras. Well, let's see. Do we still have the right number of electrons? It's good to check. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I got too many electrons. That's the problem. I should have two, four, six, eight, ten. There. That's the way it should have been. Right there. Then the decision is easy. We make a triple bond here. That gives us two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. So that should be. Oh, it's not written. I didn't put it in the slide. <clears throat> okay. So that's carbon monoxide. Let's do, let's see, what should we do? 
Uh, methanol is a more complicated molecule. Maybe we ought to look at that one. And the way methanol is written helps with how to put the atoms together. Okay, so we've got a carbon here with four. We've got three hydrogens. We've got an oxygen with six and another hydrogen. So that's uh, seven, eight, 14. Okay, this tells us the way we write organic molecules, if you have some hydrogens uh, attached to a carbon, you put them after the carbon, recognizing that the carbon is actually attached to the oxygen, like this. There. And then the hydrogens go here, here, and here. And then that oxygen also has a hydrogen on the outside. That's the way this short this shorthand gives you the structure. So we've got two, four, six, eight, ten. Four electrons left. These have all got theirs, and we work our from the outside in. Carbon's already got its octet, so oxygen has to get the four electrons. Okay, do it, do it, do it, do it. Octet, octet. That would be methanol. Okay. I see an ion there. Let's do that ion. OCN minus. OCN minus. The way that's written also helps us with the way we put the atoms together. This says that carbon's in the middle. Okay. So we got to add them up first, of course. Six, four, five, and one. Right? So that's 16. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So that's four. 12. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All used up. Okay. Now, <clears throat> carbon needs an octet. Oxygen's got an octet. Uh, nitrogen's got an octet. So, which one do we do? Well, we could do um, a double bond here and a double bond there. You know, that would work. And it would look like this. Right? But which one's more electronegative? Oxygen. So oxygen is probably going to hold on to its electrons. And nitrogen is going to have to give them up. So more than likely, what we have is this, like that, like that, like that. That's more likely. Oh. I have to break my own rule. You got to have the charge there. All right. So I think this illustrates fairly well um, that the Lewis method of assigning bonds and uh, electrons, lone pair electrons, is not perfect. It's just helpful. Okay, how would we break the, break the tie between these two? Well, there's something called the formal charge. Um, it's actually a misnomer. There's no charge. Well, the only charge is perhaps on the entire structure. But when you talk about formal charge, we're talking about formal charge of individual atoms in the structure. 
So when you calculate the formal charge, which we'll do in just a second, for each of these atoms, you want the formal charge to be as close to zero as possible for everybody. Of course, when you add up the formal charges here, they're going to be negative, negative one. For um, a neutral atom, add up the formal charges and they have to equal zero because right, there's no extra charge. But for ions, add up the formal charges and you get the charge of the anion, the ion. Okay. Um, so we use the formal charge to uh, break ties, right? This may be a valid Lewis dot structure. That one is too. But one of them is usually better than the other. And this is how we do it. Um, if you happen to have a negative formal charge calculated, then it should be assigned to the more electronegative atom. So let's, let's go through the, the calculation. So what is the formal charge? The formal charge is the difference between the valence electrons for the neutral atom standing off by itself. How many valence electrons does it have? and you subtract the number of electrons that are assigned to the atom in the molecule. Okay, how do you do that? Well, if they're lone pairs, they belong to that atom, right? So it gets both of them. If there's a bond, one gets one electron, the other gets the other electron, right? Half the number of shared electrons, okay? All right, so let's do, um, let's do an example. Okay, assign the formal charge for each one of these. We've got POCl3. This is our Lewis dot structure, right? So for phosphorus, how many uh, electrons does it have as a neutral atom? Five. How many does it have in this structure? One for each bond. That's it. Four. So its formal charge is plus one. And I say again, it doesn't have a charge. This is a bookkeeping scheme. Kind of like, um, um, my mind's gone blank. Oxidation state. Oxidation state is another way of bookkeeping. This is a different way of bookkeeping. And this is particularly useful for uh, covalent compounds. And it's very useful for organic compounds. So if you're going to take organic chemistry in the future, if you think, then be sure you understand this thoroughly because you'll see it again. Okay, how about um, oxygen? Okay, neutral atom has six. How many does oxygen have in this molecule? As two, four, six, and one is seven. One from the bond, six from the lone pairs. Okay, that means it's minus one. Chlorine, well, it has seven uh, valence electrons for the neutral atom, and it has two, four, six, plus one for the bond is seven, so its value is zero. So those are the formal charges of that structure. Now, are there any other possible structures? I mean, could we assign electrons any other way? No, in this case, um, it's not a tiebreaker. This is the only possibility. So oxygen has a minus one formal charge. All the chlorines are zeros. Phosphorus has a plus one charge. Okay. So here we have two possibilities carbon dioxide, this one or that one. So this one would give us the lowest overall, well, the uh, formal charges that approach zero for most of the atoms in the molecule. Let's see, are we gonna get, before I leave this slide? No, we didn't do that. So let's, let's do the formal charges. For these. 
All right, for this one, and this one has one pair here, and this one has that one. Okay, so what would carbon be? Carbon has four electrons. One, two, three, four. Formal charge of zero. How about this oxygen? Oxygen has six electrons, neutral atom. This one has two, four, six, seven. So this one has a, a minus one formal charge. This one has one, two, three, four, five. It has a plus one formal charge. How about this one? Okay. Carbon still has a zero. How about this one? Oxygen is six. Two, four, five, six, zero. This one's the same, zero. That's the tiebreaker. This is the preferred Lewis dot structure because it has the lowest formal charge for most of its atoms. The, I shouldn't say the lowest, the most approaching zero. All right, that's just hammering this point home. These are not actual charges. All right, so now that we know how to write the Lewis dot structure, we're going to use the Lewis dot structure in conjunction with the VSEPR model to predict geometries. First of all, what does VSEPR stand for? Okay, this is valence shell electron air repulsion. Valence shell electron pair repulsion model. All right, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, it, in a nutshell, it means that the electrons, the lone pairs and the bonding pairs want to, since they're all negative, even if they're in a bond, they're all negative entities, they repel one another. So the most stable structure is the one that puts those charges as far apart from each other as possible. That's all it means. So we predict the structure based upon the furthest distribution of all the electron pairs. And it, the prediction is around a central atom. So if you have a, a compound like this, with its other electrons, of course, then um, we're going to predict a geometry for that based on the repulsion of the lone pairs and the uh, bonds here. But it's, it's for the central atom. The geometry is based upon the central atom. Now, when you get large molecules, you start to get more than one center in the molecule, then you get combination geometries, right? uh, especially for long chain carbons, long carbon chains. You may have a geometry over here, it's one type, geometry here in the middle is a different type, another type on the end. So we're going to start off focusing on simple molecules where you only have one central atom. Okay. Um, the, the name of this model, I take issue with one thing. When we start to use it, uh, the electrons are definitely valence shell because that's, that's the model, right? The localized electron model and the um, 
valence bond theory says that it's overlap of electrons in their orbitals that forms the bond. So that's why we refer to electron pair because the bonds also repel one another. But the way we use it, a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, they're all equivalent. We treat them like electron group repulsion. So electron pair repulsion is, is a bit misleading and that'll become obvious in just a minute. Okay. So you can have a linear structure. You can have, if you have, uh, if you have only two groups that are opposite one another, you could have a linear structure like carbon dioxide. Or you could have a trigonal planar structure if you have something like this one. When we talk about uh, these structures, we're talking about the geometric shape that fits on top of the structure. The actual structure is those bonds, right? But the shape is like this. That's a triangle, an isosceles triangle, and it's all in one plane. Trigonal planar. Linear is easy. We don't need, that doesn't need any explanation. If you have four groups, like carbon tetrachloride, the most efficient distribution of those chlorines around the carbon is a tetrahedron. So your carbon's in the middle. Carbon's in the middle. And you have a chlorine up here, a chlorine in the back, chlorine there, and chlorine there. So we form like that, a tetrahedron, right? It's like a triangular-based pyramid with a carbon in the center. So the bonds actually form between the carbon and the chlorines, but the geometric structure that can be superimposed on that real structure is the tetrahedron. There are several more and we'll talk about them as we get there. But we need to uh, formalize the process of building, uh, of inferring the geometry from this model. First, you have to draw the Lewis dot structure. Then once you have the Lewis dot structure, you count the electron groups and lone pairs that surround the central atom. And then you determine the position of the atoms and the electron pairs, the lone pairs, in this regular geometric structure. So if you have something like, um, uh, water's a good example. Remember we had it looking like that before? Okay. How many lone pairs or bonding pairs, bonding groups do you have? One, two, three, four. So you have four groups, which implies a tetrahedron. Right? So you would have a tetrahedron for the electronic structure of this molecule, which means that you would have oxygen in the middle, and then you would have a hydrogen here, hydrogen there, and you have a lone pair in the back and a lone pair up here. So you would form that triangular base, and then you would get that. So you'd have these two electron pairs over there, and these hydrogens here, that's why 
the actual molecular structure after you do the electronic structure then you can infer the molecular structure by ignoring the lone pairs now it looks like this right part of that triangle and these lone pairs are back there in the background somewhere one's up here and one's back there probably be better if you had one out here and one back there Okay, so you have the Lewis dot structure, then you infer the electronic structure, geometry, then you ignore the lone pairs and infer the molecular structure. Okay. As far as bond angles go, now we're talking about reality here. The bond angle would be like uh, this, right? That's your angle. You don't talk about bond angles for lone pairs because there's no bond, right? So that's the only bond angle in this molecule. Well, in a tetrahedral structure, the perfect tetrahedron in which you have uh, four attachments to the central atom, like carbon tetrachloride, the bond angles there would all be 109.5 degrees. But when you have lone pairs out here, what they tend to do, um, bonding electrons are confined between atoms. They're more restricted. Lone pairs are not bound on one side. So they can just kind of, they balloon out, right? So these two balloon and they compress that bond angle. So it's gonna be less than 109.5. But the ideal tetrahedron angle is 109.5 for the bond angles. And you start from there. Okay, so. What can we say about HCN? Remember? C, N, H. So what's the geometry around this central atom? Well, you have one, two. You got two groups that's always linear. And since these are both bonds, then that is also the molecular geometry. Linear electronic, linear molecular. Right? And what's the bond angle? One hundred eighty degrees. That's an easy one. How about pH three? Well, I don't remember drawing this one. Uh, phosphorus is five. Uh, three hydrogens are make it eight. So it's two, four, six. We do have a lone pair right there. Okay. So what's the electronic structure here with four, one, two, three, four bonds is tetrahedron. That's electronic. How about molecular? Well, these three are going to be in the triangular base of the pyramid of the tetrahedron. And that lone pair is gonna be on the apex. So if you ignore it, what do you have? You have a triangular pyramid. Okay. How about SF4? Oh, by the way, the bond angles for uh, pH 3, 109.5 degrees because it's a part of a tetrahedron. 
recognizing that it's going to be squished just a little bit with that lone pair sitting up there. But if you're asked that question on a test, just say 109.5. SF4. Okay. SF4. So this is 28. Sulfur is 6. That's a calcogen. All right. So we have 34. So sulfur. Fluorine, 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 fluorine. So that's two, four, six, eight is uh, 26. And if with six around each one of these, that's 24. That's 24. So we have two that have to go here. All right. So how many groups do you have around the central atom? One, two, three, four, five. This is one we haven't talked about yet. When you have five, the, the best arrangement is a trigonal bipyramid. In other words, you have a, a triangle here for fluorines there, fluorine there, fluorine there. Then you have a fluorine down here and a fluorine up there. So you have a, a trigonal base in the middle, but uh, a pyramid on top, like a tetrahedron on top, and one on the bottom. So that's one, two, three, four. Oops, I got too many. <laughs> There's a lone pair up here, right? One, two, three, four with a lone pair up there. So that's the electronic structure. So how would we interpret that for um, for a um, molecular structure? Well, uh, this takes some faith, actually. I would put the lone pair up there because it's 90 degrees away from everything else, even with sulfur in the middle, right? 90 degrees away. But... The, the authors and, and all the references I've seen put the lone pair here on the pyramid and that extra fluorine up there. So what does that make? Well, it actually makes, with sulfur here, right, the lone pair would be up here. So if you ignore that lone pair, what do you have? You have a seesaw, right? That's a seesaw. All right, <clears throat> uh, there's one missing. Okay, we're going to get another one, I guess. Oh, by the way, the bond angles would be what? Well, if we use this scenario or this scenario, you've got a 180 here, right? This is in a triangular form, so this is what? Let's see, that's, that's difficult to see. Let's look at it this way. So there's a bond there, there's a bond here. No, there's a bond there. That's 90 degrees. Uh, each one of these bonds is 120, right? If you go around a circle, they all have to add up to 360 and there are three of them. So the bond angles are gonna be 120. And then the one that they leave out is the one that goes from here all the way up to there 180 so my way of thinking you have those three 90 120 180 okay um all right uh, 318. Let's see. I want to be sure we have enough time to cover all our topics. Um, yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. Get 
this straight down. There we go. All right. What is O3? Ozone. Right? Everybody knows about ozone now because we talk about the ozone hole over the Antarctic. So how would we draw ozone? Well, three times six is 18, correct? 18. Which one goes in the middle? <laughs> Trick question. It doesn't matter. One, there, there, and there. So that's two, four, 14. Okay. Uh, let's see, if we put six around the outside on each one, it'd be 12. Equals two electrons left over. Like that, like that, like that. There, there, there there and then two in the middle okay so how do we make an octet for this middle oxygen well we have to resonate it'll either come from this side to make a double bond here or it'll come from this side to make a double bond there okay so let's just pick one because the geometry is going to be the same anyway we've got a lone pair here there, 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 that. And then we've got an oxygen over here, like that, like that, like that, like that. Okay, how about that central atom? What's the geometry there? It's one, two, three. Electronic geometry is trigonal planar, right? So it's going to be something like this. Oxygen, like that, like that, and like that. Okay, this one's going to have that many. This one's going to have that many. Okay, trigonal planar. Now, what does it look like when you ignore that one? That's a bent molecule. The molecular structure is bent. Some textbooks call it angular. I like bent. It's more descriptive. Because angular could be anything. Bent is definitely, it starts straight and it gets bent. Same as water. Okay. Now let's do that one other one. I think that'll help illustrate another fact about the VSEPR model. Okay. Krypton tetrafluoride. Okay. Krypton's a noble gas. How do they get it to react with fluorine? Well, you can force it. <laughs> In fact, the higher molecular weight noble gases will react under the right conditions. But we have this compound. Now, what does it look like? Well, Krypton's eight, right? It's a noble gas. And four times seven is 28. So that's 36 electrons. So we have Krypton in the middle. We have fluorine around the outside. Right? So two, four, six, eight. 28 electrons. And if we put six around each one of these fluorines, that's uh, four times six is 24. Right? So we have four electrons left over. They have to go on the central atom. Okay. So now, how many groups do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six groups. So the electronic structure, the geometry for six groups is an octahedron. Remember, an octahedron is like that. With krypton in the middle and then a lone pair up here and a lone pair down there. So you have that octahedral shape. Just, uh, 
It's got octa means four sides, like four sides on the top, four sides on the bottom. Square pyramid. Just think about the pyramids in Egypt, right? How many sides do they have? Well, they have a square base and they have four sides. Well, if you take the mirror image and you flip one, put one on the bottom, one on top, you got eight sides. That's an octahedron. Okay. This is the most efficient distribution of electrons in the VSEPR model with the lone pairs up here and down here. That's indisputable. So what's the molecular structure? Square planar. These are all in the same plane and they're on a square. Right? So what's the bond angle? The bond angle from here to here, that's a right angle, 90 degrees. That's it. 90 degree bond angle is all there is. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> the other possibility, if you go from here to here, but if you go from here to here, that's 180 degrees, right? So technically, yes, there are two bond angles. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, just to check. If a molecule has polar bonds, will it always be polar? No. Not if the polar bonds are opposing one another in a regular arrangement that cancels all their polarities. Right. Um, carbon dioxide, right, linear molecule with opposing polarities. Uh, carbon tetrachloride would have uh, dipole moments toward each of the chlorine atoms, but they're regularly spaced in a tetrahedron, which means they all cancel each other out. So carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar, even though it has polar bonds. All right, we've done that one already, carbon dioxide, and we've proven that it's nonpolar. It's a nonpolar molecule. But remember that those polar bonds are still there. Right? So uh, there's, there's nonpolar and then there's nonpolar. Okay. Okay. Here's what I mean by that. Suppose you have That molecule is nonpolar because the bond is nonpolar. You stop there. But this one, has polar bonds. The only reason it's nonpolar is because those bonds are opposing one another. But you still have an uneven distribution of electron density. This is gonna be slightly negative, slightly negative. This will be slightly positive, right? So this is nonpolar, that's nonpolar, but this one still has that uneven distribution, which means it can interact with other mole like molecules more strongly than this one can interact with its neighbors. Right? So that's why I say, there's nonpolar and then there's nonpolar. And you can see the evidence when you look at the uh, boiling points of each one. Well, actually, um, the boiling point for liquid nitrogen is minus 195 degrees Celsius. The um, sublimation, which is even more energy intensive, of uh, solid carbon dioxide is minus 78.5. Okay. So you can see that this nonpolarity 
is more intense than this one is because this one uh, forms a solid at that temperature, whereas this one only forms a liquid at that temperature. And it never forms a solid all the way down to absolute zero. <clears throat> so there's an illustration of that uneven distribution of charge that still exists in carbon dioxide. Okay, we're still centered there. All right. Uh, lone pairs make a mo molecule polar. Do they? Well, it depends. If they're opposite one another, they cancel one another out, just like any other dipole. Okay, xenon tetrafluoride. It's kind of like krypton tetrafluoride. It does contain lone pairs, just like the, the krypton tetrafluoride did. Right? So you would have the lone pairs here, fluorines around the outside, square planar molecular structure, and the opposite electrons, lone pairs, would cancel their polarities out. All right, so I put these slides together uh, as an illustration, and these came straight out of your book. I'm pretty sure they did. Uh, yeah, send gauge. Here we go. That proves it. I gave the copyright uh, credits right there. So these come out of your book. And these are the number of electron pairs and uh, the electronic arrangements that they associate with. Right? If you have two electron pairs, it's linear. Three is trigonal planar. Four is tetrahedral, and this is electronic structure right now. We're not talking about the molecular yet. Okay. Trigonal bipyramid if you have five, and octahedral if you have six. Now you can get more complicated than that, but this is where we're going to stop. Okay. We're, we're limited on time and, and, <laughs> and intelligence of your instructor to go beyond uh, six. So we're just going to stop there. Notice the way this is, uh, this is a better drawing than I would have done. You have this square planar in the middle, and then you have the pyramid on top and the pyramid on the bottom. That's an octahedron. Okay. Um, so this is what happens to a tetrahedron if you substitute a lone pair for any atom in this structure. Say this would give you a molecular structure of the same thing, tetrahedral. But if you have one of them as a lone pair, then you have a trigonal pyramid. This is like ammonia, right? Nitrogen, three hydrogens, and a lone pair. If two of them are lone pairs, then you have uh, a bent molecule. That's water, for instance. Uh, here's an example of a trigonal bipyramid. Of course, with all five of them occupied with an atom, then you've got the same molecular structure. If only one of them is a lone pair, then you get the seesaw. If two of them, now I take issue with this one also. If you get two of them here in the uh, central triangle, then yes, you would have a T-shaped molecule. But I contend that where would those lone pairs prefer to be? They prefer to be way up here and way down there. Gives them much more room to balloon. So I contend that uh, two lone pairs in this molecule would give you a trigonal planar molecular structure. I probably need to stick that in there somewhere for posterity's sake. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, but if you do have um, three lone pairs in this uh, trigonal bipyramid, the best place for them is in the triangle right here. That's true. So that would give you a linear structure. Okay. Uh, let's see, 3.33, how much time do I have left? 
45. I've got less than 15 minutes. So if we were to, uh, we're going to have to breeze through this one a little faster than I'd like, but when phosphorus reacts with excess chlorine gas, the compound phosphorus pentachloride is formed. Um, in the liquid state, this consists of PCL5, no problem, just as stated. But in the solid state, you get a mixture, a one-to-one -one mixture of PCL4 plus and PCL6 minus ions. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Let's take the author's word for it. So what would be the geometric structures for each one of these? Well, PCL5, uh, we need to draw the Lewis dot structure. This would be PCL5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Phosphorus has 10 electrons, which is okay. Phosphorus is in the third period. It has access to three Ds. So what would be that structure? Well, the electronic and the molecular structure would be a trigonal bipyramid. Right? You don't have any lone pairs around the central atom. So that one's easy. What about the the uh, cation where you have PCL4 plus. In that case, you're missing an electron. And the only way to position that one is two, four, six, eight, and 24, yeah, 32 valence electrons would give you that um, structure. This one is a tetrahedron. Notice there are no lone pairs there either. So its structure is tetrahedral geometry. And don't forget to write that plus sign out there too. How about the anion? Right. Now we picked up, that's where that other chlorine went from the PCL4, it went over to PCL6 minus. Right. So with 48 valence electrons, what do you get? Well, you get two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve now around phosphorus. Still no lone pairs, but this is an octahedron with a negative charge. So my guess is that in the solid state, the uh, more efficient packing of the molecules is obtained by having the PCL4 plus and the PCL6 minus. They pack more efficiently that way. Uh, since solids tend toward um, uh, the most efficient packing is required. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is just sort of a historical background with uh, uh, the noble gases have filled S and P valence orbitals. Uh, they weren't expected to be reactive, but um, that never stopped any chemist before, right? <laughs> you, got, you got some chemist with enough, uh, enough budget and graduate students, put them on the problem and say, can we make compounds with the higher molecular weights? Well, notice that the higher the molecular weight, the more access you have to D orbitals, right? And that makes bonding possible. So krypton, xenon, radon, they were all synthesized compounds. Uh, xenon tetrafluoride we talked about. So the, the structure predicted for that one would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Electronic structure would be what? Octahedron. And those two lone pairs are going to be opposite one another on the apexes. That means the fluorines are in the square, square planar. Then would be, well, there's the electronic structure and it should show, oh, it gives us a choice. Well, that was, that was mighty nice of them. If the two lone pairs are out here, you get a uh, seesaw 
If the two lone pairs are here, you get a square planar. Well, how do you know the difference? Well, you need physical measurable evidence, All right? Let's see, are we gonna get it? I think so. In the structure part A, the lone pair electrons are angled at 90 degrees and that leaves, that leaves uh, 180 here and 90 here and 90 there. So you got two 90s and 180 for the molecular structure. In this one, you got 90s all around. Lone pairs require more room than bonding pairs. This is true. So the, the one that gives you the seesaw is less favorable. Whereas with the other one, they're separated by 180 degrees, which gives them more room to balloon. That structure would be preferred. All right, so um, I, I saved that story till the end. I sort of jumped my own story uh, earlier. Square planar molecular structure is preferred uh, for this scenario. Um, so this would be a nonpolar molecule. It has no measurable dipole moment, but that's for the whole molecule. Um, you, you'll notice, of course, that you still have those lone pair electrons and that negative negativity out there uh, makes them able to interact with uh, momentary positives that may appear in the molecules. So there you're talking about London dispersion forces again. Okay, that's the last of my slides. And what we'll do is um, next Monday, next Monday, next Monday, um, we'll have uh, we'll have a review. And let me check myself here. Okay, yes, that's covered, that's covered, that's covered. So we'll have next Monday will be a review and the exam on this material will be Wednesday, uh, as, as late as midnight Wednesday. And on that Wednesday, we'll jump into chapter nine. While it's still fresh and finish talking about uh, covalent bonding, and we'll, we'll introduce some more uh, topics for the uh, localized electron model, one extra topic. Uh, and then we'll go from there into the molecular orbital, molecular orbitals. Uh, but don't fret about those yet. Concentrate on this chapter first and uh, work those problems. Bring any ones to class that you, you are having trouble with. Uh, and we'll work them out first before I get into any other discussions. Uh, and then of course, let's see. Yeah. In about three minutes, I'll pop up again on uh, Chem 103, the link for that uh, Zoom session, in case you have any lab questions that you need to uh, discuss. Okay, we have three minutes. Any, any problems, any questions on this topic so far? Okay, in that case, I'll either uh, see you in three minutes or see you next Monday. <laughs>